will be back in November. We wish her well today. We are delighted to have so many people join us for an important presentation on gun violence and the stories of survivors by Elsie Hireman Kumpner. Before I introduce Elsie to uh, items, please stay muted until we go into breakout rooms. And if you haven't already done so, now's probably a good time to switch to speaker mode. To get us started today, it is my pleasure to call on Francie Schwartz, who will present a reading she has selected in keeping with today's topic. Thank you so much, Harriet. Um, this uh, poem, which I think, yes, which David is, Diskin is able to share with us, is sort of in keeping with the season. Uh, it's called A Song of Endings and Beginnings, and uh, it's written by a, a wonderful, though sadly departed, woman who was very prominent in the reform movement named Debbie Perlman. So I will read it and then um, you can all read it to yourselves or read it out loud as long as everybody is muted. Let us sing of our completions, smooth, round, silvered voices to praise your name. Every season holds starts and stops. Years of trees and spirits and souls. Days ripe with harmony and turning. Circled, cycled to order our lives. Inside, inside each completion, we hear your creation. Inside our creations, we resound with your voice. Let us mold a new shape for our completions, fluid and longing, subtle limbs that lead us onward to praise your name. Every season casts away its jagged edges, rubs away the torn moments to rejoice in the realignment of old ways made straight. Inside each refitting, we renew again your creation, pulling it taut against us, a firm bound shield of your affection. Let us sing of our completions. Your hand hovers, blesses, bids us move to new beginnings. Your hand moves us forward toward unimagined completions. As I said, that is by the late Debbie Perlman, whose official title was, find it, Resident Psalmist at Temple Beth Emmett in Evanston, Illinois. And her dates are 1951 to 2002. Thank you. Thank you, Francie, as always, for your spiritual guidance. You are a wonderful teacher and you always set the right tone. We are all eager to hear Elsie's presentation, but for some logistics. At the end of Elsie's presentation, we will have a question and answer period moderated by our excellent Sid Booth. Please post your questions on chat during the talk addressed to everyone so Sid can see your questions. At around 1 p.m. after the question and answer session, I will read several questions Elsie has suggested to spark conversation in the breakout rooms. The questions will also be posted in the chat. About 1.25, we will regroup for brief concluding remarks. Some reminders about Zoom protocol. Please stay muted until we go to the breakout room so we don't interrupt Elsie. It is up to you whether you wish to be seen, but Elsie would love to see you, so you are encouraged to leave your video on. 
Finally, in order to prevent feedback, please do not use more than one device signed into the Lunch and Learn in the same room. Now I'm happy to introduce Elsie Hireman Klumpner. Elsie received her master's degree from the Smithsonian Parsons Program in the history of American decorative arts. She worked at the Laurel Museum run by the Laurel Historical Society and taught courses in decorative arts for the Smithsonian Program. <clears throat> Elsie volunteers for the Jewish Historical Society of Greater Washington the Literary Council of Montgomery County, and the gun violence prevention movement. In her free time, Elsie enjoys reading, knitting, and making beaded jewelry, taking mixed media and collage courses. She has worked with Moms Demand Action on their Gun Sense Action Network since 2017. She has also worked with Marylanders to prevent gun violence. Elsie has served as Temple Micah's representative on the DC Faith-Based Gun Violence Prevention Network. Elsie joined Temple Micah in 2015. She is active in Micah's Wise Aging Program. In 2016, Elsie joined Temple Micah's Gun Violence Prevention Group. She lives in Silver Spring, Maryland with her husband, Jim, and their dog, Walter. With one last reminder to stay muted and to post your question to Zoom chat, I am delighted to turn the floor over to Elsie. Elsie? You one can go ahead. Now I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully that's gonna work. Let me see. Here we go. Okay, do you see anything? I hope you do. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we do. Thank you. I need to back up a little bit. Um, David, I want to go back to the beginning. But I'm you not can use your that. arrows uh, or um, go up to slide and choose. Okay. So you, the left arrow, just keep going back. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for being here today. And I'd like to thank the Lunch and Learn Committee for giving me the opportunity to speak on this topic. Um, <clears throat> I will be talking about gun violence survivors. And that includes people who have uh, been injured when people who have loved ones who have been taken from them or injured. Um, I picked this topic because there's a lot of conversation about gun violence victims, the people who die each year, but not so much attention is paid to the thousands of other people who survive injury and loss. We're all aware of the gravity of gun violence in the United States. It's a daily threat to all of us, no matter who we are, where we live, or how careful we try to be. We see reports of shootings on all of our news sources every day. We catalog the dead. We shake our heads, we express concern, and then we move on to other things. Here's some numbers. People killed by gun violence, 100 per day is the average, which makes 36,500 people a day. They are the victims who die. People who are shot and injured, roughly 230 people per day, which comes out to 83,950 people per year. Those are the survivors who've been shot and injured. Every day, more than 230 people are shot and wounded in the United States. That means that 83,950 people's lives are forever changed each year. These are survivors who must confront a myriad of adjustments in every facet of their lives. 
For every person killed by a gunshot and for every person who is shot and wounded, there are many others who are negatively affected. Family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, the entire community is surviving gun violence. They've lost something, they must adjust to something. How can we calculate those numbers? And what about the rest of us? We live in fear of gun violence. Gun violence numbers in the United States rank above every other country in the world, except for Brazil. Every one of us is surviving our climate of gun violence in this country. So who tracks the numbers of those who are shot and, sur and survive and those who've been killed? A lot of different groups. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the Gun Violence Archive, Every Town for Gun Safety, Moms Demand Action, the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Prevention and Policy, and every state, city, and town in the United States tracks these losses. At Temple Mica, we keep track of and remember victims of gun violence, those who have lost their lives in DC by reading the names of victims at weekly services. We know what happens to the victims. They're buried and mourned. They become a statistic and the numbers rise every day. But what about the survivors? Who are they? Who pays attention to them? And what burdens do they bear? Physical effects from injuries, pain, adaptation to disabilities, psychological effects such as fear, anxiety, loss of capacity, and self-esteem and identity. Financial effects, loss of income, medical bills, new adaptations to living spaces, using transportation, employment prospects. And there are effects on relationships, new and old, with spouses, partners, children, parents, siblings, friends, neighbors, bosses, co-workers, every, every person that the victim has uh, interacted with. We must hear their stories and we must acknowledge their burdens. We must pay attention. I could list the names of gun violence survivors. I could tell you what and who they've lost, but survivors of gun violence are capable of telling their own stories. <coughs> we'll hear from five survivors and they're going to share their stories with us through me. Colin Goddard. Colin Goddard is surviving the mass shooting at Virginia Tech on April 16th, 2007. Colin was a 22 year old college student when he was shot four times during a, a mass shooting at Virginia Tech. He was attending French class. Colin survived. Many of his fellow students did not. Colin has been active in the GVP movement, gun violence prevention movement, not in response to his own injuries, but in response to the Sandy Hook mass shooting that took place December 14th, 2012. A shooter killed 20 children and six teachers in Newtown, Connecticut. Colin calls it his Newtown movement. He says, quote, I'm a firm believer in the idea that we as individuals should not be recognized for the things that happened to us, but for the impact of what we do in the future. This opened my eyes to a world I knew little about. Okay. Um, beginning in 2012, Colin worked on federal legislation at the Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence. He then worked as a senior policy advocate for every town for gun safety. He's currently serving as director of Source Global PBC in Bethesda, Maryland. He remains active and active every town survivor fellow speaking out to raise awareness of gun violence. In the years since he was shot, he has made it his life's mission to ensure, to help ensure that tragedies like the Virginia Tech shooting and Sandy Hook would never happen again. 
He suggests that changing the conversation to focus on safety instead of simply gun control and building momentum locally will increase support for action nationwide. Another burden that Colin carries after being shot. Colin was left with shattered lead bullet fragments in his body. Doctors were able to safely remove only a, some of these fragments. A 2017 blood test to determine the amount of lead in his body revealed his lead level to be 37. A healthy person has a level of two. This means that Colin is left with long-term health risks related to lead poisoning, such as neurological problems, kidney dysfunction, and reproductive issues. He takes 31 pills a day as part of a chelation treatment, a chemical process to help the body expel excess or toxic metals. He is only one of hundreds of survivors every year who live with these toxic levels of lead in their bodies. In 2011, a film was made about his experience. It was called Living for 32. Colin revisits his former classroom and emotionally recounts the terror of that day. Also in the film, Colin is shown wearing a hidden camera as he documents trips he made to gun shows across America. The camera reveals how easy it is for anyone to purchase a gun with no ID or Brady background check and just a handful of cash. Another survivor, Christian Haney. We see here Christian with his mom and below that is his dad. Christian Haney in Washington DC is surviving the loss of his mother, Jan and the shooting of his father, Tim, in May of 2005. While returning a boat from a holiday vacation in California, Jan and Tim were shot by an angry stranger with a gun. Jan died. Tim survived multiple gunshot wounds. Christian, then 19 years old, his siblings and his father are all survivors. Following the shooting, Christian and his family responded to their loss by becoming gun violence prevention advocates. Christian and his father, Tim, started a chapter of the Brady campaign to prevent gun violence in Ventura County, where they lived at the time, and helped to pass a number of local gun safety ordinances, such as a requirement to report lost or stolen guns. He's built his career around gun violence prevention. For 10 years, he worked at the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence as the legislative director. Since 2019, he has worked at Brady as their vice president of policy, leading all legislative efforts at the federal and state levels. Christian's thoughts on being a, a gun violence survivor, quote, <clears throat> you realize it's not just one person who's affected by that act of violence. It's an entire network a community of individuals, mothers, brothers, acquaintances, whose lives are going to be changed forever in the way ours have been. I think about where I am now and all the things my mom has missed out on. I married my wife in that time, time span. My brother also got married and now he has a daughter who will grow up not knowing her grandmother. My wife, my children will never know, never have the opportunity to know one of the greatest people I've ever known in my life. Newtown was horrific. It's hard enough to think I had to lose my mother, but when you think about mothers and fathers losing their children and the scale to which it happened, all of these events are horrific. Aurora was a hard day. The Sikh temple shooting was a hard day. Oregon was a hard day. Every time this happens, my heart rate goes back. You get put right back into those shoes and know the long road ahead of these families and the fact that it's going to be with them for the rest of their lives. You never get over it. The pain and the scar that I have is just as fresh as the day it happened, except now it's just a part of me and I've had more time to deal with it. Christian and his family are survivors dedicated to making a difference and ending the scourge of gun violence in the US. 
State Trooper Ken Dillon. <clears throat> Ken Dillon of Connecticut is surviving the experience of being a first responder at the scene of the Sandy Hook shooting in Newtown, Connecticut on December 14th, 2012. In 2012, he was a state trooper who during a 30 year career as a volunteer firefighter, an EMT, a paramedic and a police officer thought he had seen quote, the worst of the worst, unquote, until he was among the first responders to the scene of the mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary in Newtown. For Ken, that experience was, quote, the straw that broke the camel's back, unquote. Plagued by anger, flashbacks, sadness, and fear of another attack, he began drinking heavily, carrying his gun with him at all times, preparing for another attack. He withdrew from friends, his marriage broke down. After a DUI arrest, Ken realized he needed help. He was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress syndrome disorder, sorry. Ken says, quote, we rush into burning build fires or deal with the worst injuries, that's our job. It's what we're trained to do. But we all are also human and sometimes our brains can't compute the horrible things we see, unquote. Since 2012, Ken has been struggling to function. Multiple DUI arrests, a car accident this year, and citations for other offenses have affected his career and left him struggling for balance in his life. Lawrence Miller, a psychiatrist in Boca Raton, Florida, who often treats first responders dealing with mental trauma has explained, quote, these are normal reactions to an abnormal circumstance. These mass shootings, especially when children are involved, that's when you see the first responders break down. Ken is surviving and he is struggling. Ah, Jaron Peterson and James Cole. James was killed in November of 2014. Jaron, a teacher in Minneapolis, is surviving the loss of her boyfriend, James Cole. He was shot and killed November 16th, 2014. He was not the intended target, but he died anyway. One ordinary evening, Jeff left, James left their apartment to meet a friend. The events that followed are a familiar scenario for many families of gun violence victims. Jaron worried when James didn't come home. She learned that there'd been a shooting near her apartment. She and his family contacted the police, but were given no information. By 1 a.m., and this is hard for me to envision, they were driving from hospital to hospital looking for James. That could be any of us. At 4 a.m., James' mom was advised by a hospital security guard to call the county morgue. James had been there since 10.30 p.m. He was never admitted to the hospital because he was dead when the police arrived on the scene. Imagine a mother finding out about her son's death by identifying his dead body over the phone. Jaron remembers thinking, why didn't anybody tell us, unquote. The police would only tell them that James was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Several months later, they learned that while James was out, an acquaintance asked him for a ride. They stopped at a house to drop something off. While James waited in the car, someone came out of the house with a sawed off shotgun and fired at the car. The bullets hit James and he died at the scene. In Jaron's words, quote, gun violence has been devastating for me in so many ways. Living with grief, fear, anxiety, Having to sort through the logistics of planning a funeral, dealing with trials was incredibly difficult. It would have been easy to move from this neighborhood that's often stricken with gun violence. But I decided instead to become an advocate for my neighborhood. Jaron now works with Every Town Survivor Network. Quote, today I speak at events and work with local Moms Demand Action Leadership Team to tell Jaron's story and to advocate for solutions to this senseless crisis. I'm an everyday average person. James shooting death completely altered my life. 
I want people to fully understand that no one is immune from gun violence, to gun violence. I still suffer from repercussions. The aftermath of gun violence follows me like a shadow and haunts me at the most unexpected times and places. There's no escape. This is my new reality. Jaren is surviving and trying to warn others. Maureen, Pedri, Scott, and Sarah. Maureen Pedri and her family are gun violence survivors. Maureen is surviving the loss of her daughter, Stacy, who was 13 years old when she was killed. Brother Scott was eight and baby Sarah was eight months old and they are surviving the loss of their sister. This happened on May 21st, 1980. Stacy was shot and killed while playing with friends in the home next door. One of Stacy's friends pulled an unsecured loaded shotgun off the wall of the room they were in, they were playing in. In an effort to scare the girls, he pointed it and pulled the trigger. Maureen states, quote, it was May 21st, 1980, a Wednesday, just another normal school day. Stacy was in the eighth grade and her typical after school routine included picking up her sister, Sarah, from the babysitter's house on her way home. That day I arrived home from work at about 5.30 p.m. Police officers were at the front door telling me something had happened to Stacy. They took me to the house next door to where Stacy had been hanging out with some friends in front of a crowd of strangers. I was told Stacy had been shot to death. Sarah was unharmed. I had a million questions, but I was not allowed to ask them. Later that day, the police told me that Stacy was visiting a boy's home with two other girls. The boy pulled a loaded shotgun off the wall. He pointed the gun at the girls to scare them and pulled the trigger. Stacy died instantly. Maureen is not the first or the last mother to lose a child this way. There was no intention to kill, but the, pre the presence of the gun and the disregard for its lethal power caused the unavoidable death of a child. Here are some numbers about children. The Gun Violence Archive records daily numbers of deaths and injuries. So far, of children, so far in 2021, tw yes, 2021, as of last week, 236 children between zero and 11 years have been shot and killed. 595 children between the ages of 11 and zero and 11 years have been shot and have survived. 925 children between the ages of 12 and 17 have been shot and killed. 2,608 children between the ages of 12 and 17 have been shot and survived. What will be the numbers at the end of this year? Maureen wanted to understand. She wanted to know why, how, and why her daughter was dead. In Maureen's words, quote, the months that followed were plain torture. I was not allowed to speak to anyone who was there during the shooting. The boy was charged, but never went to trial. There was only a hearing. The hearing took five minutes and no one said anything to us no explanation, no apologies. I never fully blamed the boy. I felt his parents were responsible because they were aware of the risks posed. Their neighbor's son had shot and paralyzed a woman just months before Stacy was killed. Stacy died 37 years ago and the pain of her dying in such a senseless and preventable way has not subsided. The death of a child changes a person forever. Your life has never been, nor will it ever be the same. It impacts your marriage, your friendships, your sense of worth, sense of security. My son, who was eight years old at the time of Stacy's death, still suffers from anxiety, which I believe is a direct result of the shooting. Today, Maureen's, Maureen's daughter, Sarah, an infant when her sister was killed, is a passionate advocate for gun safety 
and educates others about safe and responsible gun storage through Moms Demand Action's Be Smart program, which teaches people about gun safety and keeping, not having access, children not having access. Maureen's advice, quote, to parents who own guns for the sake of your children and the children who visit your home, please store your guns responsibly, locked, unloaded, and separate from ammunition. It could mean the difference between life and death, unquote. Here are all the survivors we're talking about today. Colin, Christian, Ken, Jaron, Maureen, Sarah, and Scott. They are all gun violence survivors, but there are many more. And here's just a selection. Kathy Shore, a photographer, has written a book called Shot. And these are a few of the people who appear in her book. These people have all survived being shot. Karina, Josh, Sharika, Chloe, Cora, Sarah, an eight-year-old girl, James, Isaiah, Ryan, Marles, Scott, and Sarah. What can we offer them besides our thoughts and our prayers? It's not going to the next slide, but that's okay. Here are some resources for gun violence survivors. Every town for gun safety runs a survivors network that provides a nationwide community of survivors who are working to end gun violence and amplify the voices of survivors on a national stage. Some of the people we talked about today are participating in that. Brady United provides emotional support to people and communities affected by gun violence. The American Counseling Association offers services to assist anyone in need of support following an episode of trauma, including surviving gun violence. Here in Washington, DC, the Wendt Center for Grieving and Loss provides a number of services that support adults and children who have experienced the loss of a loved one, including gun, violence, gun violence survivors. And we're here at Temple Micah, we're familiar with the Trayron Center, which is located in Southeast Washington. It was founded by Ryan Nickens, a gun violence survivor. She has suffered multiple losses of family members and friends in her short life. Motivated by concern for the children who have witnessed or experienced loss related to gun violence, the Trayron Center mission Trey Run Center's mission is, quote, to expose gun violence survivors to therapeutic modalities with a focus on the inclusion of creative arts and to equip survivors with strategies to healthfully endure the complexities of loss while promoting community health and solidarity. And she's doing an amazing job. There are many, many more organizations like this all over the country, um, in every community, in every city. These stories are hard to hear. The photos are hard to look at. We need to pay attention to the gun violence culture that we live in. We need to care about what's happening on our streets to our citizens. We need to pay attention to services for survivors, but also suicide prevention, massive access to loaded guns, problem solving by violence rather than reason. This all needs to be done. And that's what I have, thank you. So I will um, try to unshare my screen, which is not happening. Okay. Either you or David. <laughs> stop share. You just say stop yeah, share. So I'm trying to get my cursor over there. Oh, okay. And it's <clears throat> not going. Oh, there we go. Kind of. Okay. There we go. Well, okay. There we go. Good. Yeah. 
Thank you, Elsie, for your very powerful and excellent presentation. Thank you. The stories of survivors after gunshots. <clears throat> um, uh, very powerful. Anyways, Elsie uh, left us with some questions. Uh, I'll say the questions and we'll post them in the chat room. Um, are you or do you know any survivors of gun violence? Can you think of ways you might be able to support survivors of gun violence? If anybody has a question for Elsie, please post it in the chat address to everyone. And I'd like to turn the program over to Sid Booth, our moderator for the question and answer period. Thank you, Elsie. You're welcome. Um, quite an impact here uh, from your presentation. Um, just roughly speaking from the statistics you provided, and in, um, I think, a conservative estimate, approximately 100,000 Americans are shot or killed by guns every year, if I, if I understood the numbers, just in big numbers. Yes. That means in a decade, a population of more than the population of Washington, D.C., I say it that way, to try to grasp the enormity of the um, trauma that our society is living with. In your readings and conversations, have you come across information about the societal blow, this, how this affects us in contrast to other developed uh, nations? Um. There are studies of, of that. Um, I can't quote one of them right now, but um, we definitely have a major problem here that other countries don't have. Not that they don't have guns or they don't have killings, but the amount of the gun violence that goes on here, as I said, is, is just um, head and shoulders above every other country. And a lot of people in this country, I didn't have time to talk about all of it, but the, the, there are health providers who look at it as a public health issue. There are schools that deal with it as a, something they have to deal with every day with all of their students and kids who are shot outside the school. They have people who will go in and do therapy with those teachers and those kids. Um, it's, I often think to myself, what must it be like to live in another country where I wouldn't be doing this volunteer work, where there wouldn't be this huge need and all of these, I don't know how many people volunteering in the gun violence prevention movement. Um, it, it's a huge community and only because of the way we handle guns and access to guns in this country. Turning to the questions from um, the congregation in the chat room, uh, Barbara Diskin asks, uh, as with many things, I always wonder what I can do as an individual to deal with gun violence in our country. I would love to do more than give money. Um, probably the most effective thing that you can do is vote. Uh, you can join organizations, you can get together and talk about how awful gun violence is, you can uh, have marches, you can have demonstrations, you can listen to survivors talk. There are many, many resources with every town and with moms and Brady and all of those organizations that support uh, gun violence prevention and survivors. So you can do all that, but after some years of working on this, and this is primarily why I chose to talk about the survivors and not about legislation or anything else, is because that's where progress can be made, theoretically. 
Uh, we've made no progress on the federal level in many years, and we won't as long as Mitch McConnell breathes. Um, on the state level, the movement across the country has been able to make, um, make some progress. So I would advise people, and in Virginia, it's a big issue and there's a lot of activity around it. Um, get involved with your legislature, get involved with your local Moms Demand Action um, chapter, find out what they're doing, what legislation is coming up in, um, in the legislative session, which around here starts in January, and I think Virginia too. Um, learn who, who supports gun violence prevention legislation and who doesn't. You know, talk to your individual delegates and your state senator and find out what's being done. That's something you really can do. Um, and that's where a lot of the changes in the last few years have happened is on the state level. From your experience, um, which of the uh, local or national organizations might be the best clearinghouse for finding a range of resources? I think both every town and moms, they are really a, a joint organization. Um, Giffords, the Giffords Law Center, which was founded by um, Gabby Giffords and her husband. Um, they're probably the primary ones where you should start. If you're in Maryland, there's a wonderful group called Marylanders to Prevent Gun Violence, which primarily works with the legislature every year, identifying, uh, writing bills, pushing bills, identifying pressure points where they need to put pressure to get them um, passed. Um, I, the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence, I think is a Virginia uh, organization. Uh, there are a lot of Virginians who are part of the uh, part of their staff. Um, so that would be my my recommendation. And the Temple Group that you you belong to and have worked with uh, is it active now? And is there an opening for more volunteers? It is not active now. Um, it hasn't been for a couple of years. Uh, we had a very busy two or three years. Uh, right after, well, I guess, 2015, um, and then through the Trump years. Um, but I think we did a lot of activities that we wanted to do. And I guess in my mind, the next logical step is to go toward legislation and learning about that and supporting it and supporting candidates, which Temple Micah can't really do. Um, and so there is an opening for anybody who wants to talk about starting another group. Robin Garnett, um, who has been on the committee and is very active in social issues, I know that she's interested in, in seeing it revived. Um, so. And uh, Jerry Nelson uh, asked, how did you come to do this work? Mm. Trump was elected. And I was so angry and so upset. And I would, that along with recently joining Temple Micah, meeting Rabbi Susan Landau, attending one of the, the programs, um, I knew that was a place that I wanted to do work. So that's, what, that's how it happened. Uh, Jan Gordon asks, do you know what is done in schools to encourage safe dispute resolution? Mm. I know programs exist. I don't know very much about what's going on in the schools about that. I, I don't. I wish I did. But... Uh, John Hirschman asks, why do you think there's so much political resistance in this country to ah. building firearms? Money, money, and money. There's a lot of resistance. Well, that's a big topic. I can only say a couple of little things about it. There's a huge amount of money driving the, the um, production of guns in this country and selling gun use to the citizens. 
and there is a lot of money behind it. Um, and that just keeps coming and coming. And, and I think too, we have to admit that there is a culture in this country that um, just loves violence and thrives on seeing it and emulating it. Um, it's, I grew up with it. Everybody my age did. I don't know about people older than me, but uh, we just we have this culture that just cannot be easily reckoned with. Um, and legislation seems like the only way uh, to address it, in my opinion, at this time. I would doubt that anyone within, or many, within the sound of our voices grew up in an environment where guns were part of life in a positive way. People who come from rural communities, smaller towns, where law enforcement sometimes isn't as uh, handy as one would want it, hunters, et cetera. Um, did you have that kind of experience yourself? I did, but I grew up as a, a white child in white America. And I think there have been communities all of these years that are very conversant with gun violence and guns and, and threats that make them afraid um, and feel like they have to have a gun in their, um, in their hands. I, I just, we are, I would venture to make the generalization that everybody on this call is very lucky not to have grown up with guns as a threat to them. But I know my entertainment did, movies, television, books, everything. And that's just kind of my own soapbox. I feel that that affects how people think. I've well, always- guns are, guns are glorified in our yeah, society. They and are. People get shot and up, and it's, I'm sorry. It's Nancy Raskin wants to know, how did you choose the examples that you uh, provided for us? There are so many survivors. There are, and um, in a couple of cases, I wanted to talk, and I guess really this goes through almost all the cases except for Ken Dillon. I wanted to talk about people who have suffered, who are survivors, who are active in the movement, but not everybody. I, I didn't want every example to be like that. And Ken Dillon is, is not one of those examples. He's somebody who is really truly struggling still and had his life impacted. And I don't even know what the future holds in terms of getting him back on a track in his life. Um, but uh, Christian Haney and Colin Goddard, I've heard speak and Jaron and Maureen, I just found by searching the internet for survivors. I did a lot of searching for survivors and some of them came from the Everytown website because there's a tremendous amount of information out there about survivors if you wanna look for it. Um, and I knew I couldn't do 20 people, so I had to select five. Uh, Harriet Weiner asks, are, are you or do you know any uh, survivors of gun violence? Oh, you know, Sid, that's probably best for our... Um, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Those are the... <laughs> yeah. those are the yeah, uh, sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, okay. That would be fine for our breakout rooms. Um, do you have a demographic breakdown of gun violence victims, David Diskin asks? I don't, not, I, I did not put that together for this presentation. Um, so I, I'm not gonna venture a guess without more information. Were you a member of the congregation when um, uh, there was a, uh, a play given, a reading uh, given uh, in the sanctuary uh, with victims of gun violence and stories. Uh, you were, can you recall that for some of the people who are not here? I do. I, I, did, I was part of that effort. That's when our, our gun violence commit, uh, prevention committee was, was very active. And we partnered with Mosaic Theater 
Ari Roth at the time was the director. And there had been a play that was produced the year before we had our, our session in the synagogue. Um, the Gospel of Loving Kindness maybe was the name. I'm sorry, I don't remember. And so we, we had the cast um, come from Mosaic and they didn't put on the entire play, I don't think, but they, they did readings. Yeah. And then we also had Ryan Nickens was there who was a survivor and we had some other women and perhaps men who were survivors who live in Washington DC and live with um, gun violence, fear all the time. And it was well attended. Um, it was several years ago now, so I, that's really what I remember. But Temple Micah really embraced that program. Well, I re remember the power of that presentation, and I am today unable to dis distinguish between the actors and the actual survivors. The acting was so uh, powerful. Uh, Barbara Diskin asked, maybe we give young men mixed messages by training them to kill people in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Wow, that's a big topic, war. Um, I can't really comment on that. Um, I think we give young men or young people mixed messages more in America within the gun culture that, oh, guns are romantic. Guns are cool. Take your, you, take your girlfriend to the, the shooting range and, and shoot off some rounds and impress her. I've seen that with my own eyes. Um, when I, I took um, a gun, uh, but it was, to learn how to use a gun, I took a course. And in that group of people, during the class, people were talking about Clint Eastwood and Arnold Schwarzenegger. These were adults and that's the kind of connection they were making. That was kind of the, the thrill they were getting from, learn, from learning about guns and learning how to use one and getting a license to use one. That's sad. It was sad to me. Nancy uh, Raskin <laughs> asks, do you have any hope that the Stoneman Douglas High School survivors can make a difference in changing the minds of legislators? I think, yes, I think they, they can, and I think they have. Um, they're now older and gone off to live, you know, their full lives, but um, they did a tremendous amount of work organizing the march that they had. Um, down in downtown Washington. Um, and I, I, I know that a number of them have become active in the movement. Helen Epps uh, mm -hmm. notes that you have not spoken about domestic violence, which comprises a huge percentage of those killed by gun violence. Can you speak to that somewhat? That's true. I did not include any domestic violence survivors in my uh, list of people. I, maybe I should have, I, I just couldn't include everybody um, or cover every circumstance. I didn't uh, deal with suicide either. And that is one of the largest numbers of people who die from gun violence every year are suicide. Um, suicide victims. Uh, in advance of uh, today's event, I sent you a little information about MASS, and I just want to mention this to our audience. MASS is the title of a new movie. I'm not sure it's playing here yet, but it's um, two couples meet to in private uh, to discuss a MASS school shooting. And Two of them are parents of a slain student, and two of them are parents of a shooter. The uh, director and writer is a man named Franz Kranz, and um, he's, 
it um, is enjoyed. I, I heard about it on uh, Scott Simon's uh, broadcast on Saturday morning. I don't think it's yet playing here. Do you have any reaction to that? Do I have a reaction to it? Um, I think I think that's a useful exercise. It sounds like a good movie. I would like to see it. Um, there have been efforts before over the last few years to put together people on both sides of the issue um, of gun, supporting gun violence prevention and people who feel that they're threatened by it. And certainly uh, I think that the, the play that we talked about a minute ago about at the Mosaic, that was a play in which two mothers had to face each other because one, the, the son of one mother had killed the son of the other mother. It, it's a good topic, it's scary, um, but I, I would recommend the movie. If it's, you know, uh, somebody it's, wanted to know the title, it was David, it was Mass. Yes. Um, and he also asked if you might know how suicide rates in the United States might differ from other countries. That I don't know. I don't, I'm sorry. Okay, we're down to the last uh, minute or two if somebody has a uh, burning issue to throw into the chat, now's your time to do it. Seeing none, I think it's uh, the question period is over and we'll move on to the um, to the breakout rooms, which we will hear about from Harriet. And thank you personally, Elsie, for bringing this to us today and so eloquently. Again, thank you, Elsie, for this powerful presentation. And thank you, Sid, for being our wonderful moderator for the q and A. I want to thank Karen, David, Francie, Sid, Jerry, Barbara, and the whole Lunch and Learn Committee for their faithful work, which keeps our program flourishing. Thanks to the Temple MICA office staff, particularly Janelle, uh, Lisa, Sarah Brown, and Beth Worland. And we're wishing Karen a complete and speedy recovery today.